All right, Luke Acts for Beginners, lesson number 17, the persecution of the church, uh, the first part. There's a whole section that we will do on this. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 760. Uh, so far in this book, Luke has uh, focused his attention on Peter and Peter's ministry and the persecution at the hands of the Jewish leaders. Beginning in this chapter, Luke brings the church and its inner workings to the foreground. So let's look at our uh, outline, shall we? Look at our outline to see what point we have reached in our story. So we've had Peter's first sermon, the, all the great things that are taking place on Pentecost, uh, post-Pentecost uh, ministry, the persecution of Peter and the apostles begins today, persecution of the, of the church. And Luke is now going to describe events taking place and people who were part of that first congregation of the church uh, in uh, Jerusalem. So let's begin reading chapter 6, verse 1. It says, now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So it seems that after they were set free, the apostles continued their work in Jerusalem, where it is estimated that the church is now you know, 20,000 plus people, very large group of people. Now we read previously that members sold land and donated the proceeds to the church, and here we see one of the ways that the church used this money, and that was to provide food for the widows that were part of that group. I've done a, you know, a quick count of our congregation, about 400 people here, and we have about 25 widows, 400 people, about 25 widows. Imagine a church 20,000 plus people, how many widows you would have. What a challenge that would be to service. And apparently this distribution and care was taking place on a daily basis. You know, once in a while somebody, you know, somebody has some surgery and you know, the, the ladies and, and well, various families will go to their house and bring some, you know, some casseroles, get them by for a couple of days. You know, here every day they were ministering to these, uh, to these women. Now apparently this distribution and care was taking place, as I say, on a daily basis, expensive and time consuming. Now the Hellenistic Jews were not Greek converts to Judaism, they were Jews who were born outside of Israel. So note that Luke refers to the Jews born in Israel as native Hebrews to make this distinction. So these Hellenistic Jews were converted to Christianity. Now we don't know why the widows of the Hellenistic Jews were being neglected, doesn't give us a reason. Perhaps the rapid growth of the church caused some to be neglected. Perhaps the Hellenistic Jews were sensitive to the fact that all the church leaders, meaning the apostles, were native Hebrews. And any difference in the treatment of their people was you know, easily seen. You know, people are sensitive, aren't they? People are sensitive. Uh, in any organization, but in the church as well. Sometimes we take offense, sometimes for no reason, but sometimes you know, for good reason. So Luke does not comment on the legitimacy of their complaint, only that things came to a head with their complaint because it revealed, uh, or rather it reached the ears of the, of the apostles. So we get to the solution. So the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. So it's interesting to note that it seems that the apostles themselves were actively involved in caring for the widows at this point. And they conclude that this task was crowding out their more important work as leaders and teachers in the church. Remember, they're just kind of finding their way here. The church is established, but Unlike us, they don't have the scriptures to go to and to, you know, to read, to find out. They're, they're, they're kind of making their way here. Even today, you know, elders and preachers often find themselves overloaded with tasks and responsibilities not connected with their primary task of teaching and preaching and ministering to the, to the flock. So this problem moved them to begin delegating some of the work they had been doing and establish a structure 
for this uh, young church. So let's continue reading. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles and after praying, they laid their hands on them. So the apostles, first of all, established some qualifications for those who were to be chosen. Men, Luke uses the specific term referring to males. He doesn't, it's not mankind or just people in general, but he, he specifies males. Uh, and I make a quick aside here. They could have established a precedent here for uh, sisters in, the, in Christ, for females, to serve as deacons. I mean, if there was ever a moment for this to happen, this was it right here. And why not? I mean, serving food to, to other widows it would seem to me that uh, this is a task more easily done by women, you know, women to women type thing. And yet the apostles uh, you know, chose to, um, to have only men uh, do this, not simply serving, but men to serve in this task in the, as deacons. They were to choose seven men, not nine or 15, seven they said. The apostles determined that seven men would be required to do the job properly. Imagine seven deacons for just one responsibility. <laughs> they were to be spiritually mature men, full of the Spirit, and those who possessed wisdom. In other words, they knew how to apply or to use the knowledge that they possessed. So one th knowledge is you know, understanding, knowledge of God's word, God's will, Wisdom is how do I apply that knowledge in a proper, in a proper way? You know, a lot of times we're going to choose a man to serve as deacon who's a good carpenter. Yeah, let's get Billy. Billy's a carpenter. Come on, he's got his own, he's got his own business. He's got tools. What better guy to get as a deacon? He's got tools. He's got time. Come on, let's get that guy. Or Joe, who's a bookkeeper, thinking that how this man is able to serve the church is the primary quality that this person should have. And yet, when I read here, <laughs> I didn't see the apostles saying, uh, are there any caterers in the congregation? Are there any cooks? Anybody who runs an inn? How about farmers who have access to food? Have we got some of those guys? They don't mention that at all as qualifications. Peter's criteria only names spirituality and wisdom as the things to look for in a potential deacon. Of course, Paul you know, elaborates on this later on in Timothy, but for now. Then the apostles instructed the church to select the candidates for deacon. The church had to choose men who were both spiritual and wise to be considered for the role of deacon. The term deacon, just a simple translation, actually originally meant a waiter, somebody who waited on tables, a servant, a minister. All these words refer to the same thing. Now I'm not saying you can't choose a man who's a carpenter, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the primary qualifications that they set forth was that he be a man full of the spirit and wisdom. It's okay, it's okay if he's a carpenter or a, a farmer, that's great that his skill perhaps matches the need at the moment. But that's not the primary qualification. That's the point I'm trying to make here. The apostles would authorize the men selected and vetted by the congregation to serve as deacons. And this they did, how? By prayer and the laying on of their hands in order to commend them into service. That's the order that we see here the pattern established in the book of Acts, and it's the order I, you know, that we follow here you know, to select and, and to commend deacons into, into service. So the results, it says, the word of God kept on spreading and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, 
and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. This is what Luke writes, but what he doesn't write is interesting. What he doesn't write is, and there was a division in the church and there was infighting because of the, the trouble with the, the food distribution. Because if that problem got to the ears of the, of the apostles, it means there was a problem going on. There was murmuring, there was dissatisfaction, there was gossip, there was trouble. And yet the results that Luke writes is, wow, the church just kept on growing. Well, the church doesn't grow when there's division and trouble. So Luke says the apostles returned to their essential work of prayer and teaching and we see the results of this renewed effort as Luke records the continued growth of the church. Luke also mentions that the gospel is impacting the higher levels of society by this time, uh, society and religion, as some priests now are beginning to uh, come to, uh, to faith as well. So now the persecution begins as always. You know, when everything's going great, watch it. In the church, and that's not just in the first century church, that's in the 21st century church. Everything's going great, the pews are full, you know, we're making budget, it's great, people are being baptized, and we're doing good works. Watch it, trouble ahead, exactly what happens here. In Acts chapter uh, six, verse eight and nine, Stephen is arrested. Remember the same Stephen who was you know, appointed as a deacon? It says, um, and Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both uh, Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. So Luke notes that beyond his work as a deacon, Stephen also performed miracles and thus the first member of the church aside from the apostles to do so, that is recorded. So we learn later on that the ability to speak in tongues and heal others and work miracles was transferred to believers by the laying on of the apostles' hands in Acts chapter eight, verses 14 to 18. We'll, we'll read that when we get to that part. This is most likely how Stephen received his ability to do these things. He already was mature spiritually and wise, which explains his ability to preach and teach and debate with the Hellenists. Now Stephen himself was a Hellenistic Jew, converted to Christianity, and he was now attacked by other Hebrew Hellenists who considered him a traitor for his conversion. They tried debating him unsuccessfully, and so they resorted to the same tactics used to have Jesus arrested. Same, same playbook, same playbook. Oh, he's talking against Moses. He's defiling the law, he's trying to destroy you know, our religion. He's guilty of blasphemy. So they stir up the people with lies and this provides the Jewish leaders an opportunity to arrest him. And of course, if he's doing miracles and he's strong in the word, he's got a higher profile, doesn't he? You know, the way the Satan works is you know, attack the leaders, attack the leaders, attack the elders, attack the deacons, attack the ministers. Get those guys first. If you can break those guys down. Have you ever been to a church where the, where the preacher runs off with one of the members' wives? You ever been to a church like that? I hope not, but if you've ever been to a church or heard of a church, what a blow that is to that church. You know, the evil one doesn't have to hurt any of the, of the 1,000 members. He just has to get the guy up in the pulpit or he just has to get one of the elders to fail, to fall. What a blow that is to the church. What a discouragement that is. So same thing, let's, let's Stephen, he's rising up, he's powerful in the word. Let's get that guy. So in Acts chapter six, we read the trial begins. It says, they put forward false witnesses who said, this man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. 
For we have heard him say that this Nazarene, Jesus, will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze upon him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. So once before the, Jews, the Jewish leaders, several charges are brought against him, which are nearly the same as the ones brought against Jesus. You know, it worked then, <laughs> well, you know, let's try it again. Luke only records the various accusations, but no evidence. Notice there was no evidence for Jesus, and here no evidence. Since there was no evidence to support the accusations, only false witnesses who lied in order to condemn him. Very much like Jesus, Stephen did not debate or defend himself against his accusers. Perhaps included in his promise to provide his disciples with the wisdom to answer those accusing them when the time came, along with this came the ability to know when to say nothing as well. You know, Jesus promised his apostles, you know, they'll take you in front of judges and they'll scourge you. And he said, don't worry. He says, I'll let you know what you have to say at the right time. And I think along with that promise was also, and I'll let you know when to say nothing. So we get Stephen's response, Acts chapter 7, verses 1 to 53. I just want to read a couple of verses of that. The high priest said to him, are these things so? Stephen said, hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. So prodded by the high priest to speak and answer the charges, you know, guilty or not guilty, which they would have dismissed to find him guilty and punish him anyways, Stephen instead begins a long monologue that proceeds to tell the story of the Jewish people beginning with Abraham and his initial call by God to leave his home and to come to the land of Canaan. He summarizes their history and heroes as well as God's dealing with them as his chosen people. He brings the story to the present day and he concludes with the same accusation that Peter made when he and the other apostles were dragged before these very same people. So we skip forward to Acts 7 verse 51. He says, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your father did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the laws ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. So his accusations are harsh, but true. First, they were stubborn, hard-hearted, and completely unspiritual. You know, uncircumcised of heart meaning you don't, you don't have the spirit. They were disobedient, resisting God's spirit. They were as evil and disobedient as their forefathers. He's saying to them, the, the prophets that God sent to announce the coming of the Messiah, you killed those guys. You not only killed those guys, you killed the Messiah when he finally came too. So they not only killed the prophets sent to announce the coming of the Messiah, they also killed the Messiah himself and they received the divinely appointed law, but they did not honor it or keep it. So Stephen's indictment of them is complete. Guilty in the past, their ancestors in the past acted as they did in the present. Guilty in the present of killing their own Messiah. And he leaves out the future because the judgment to come for their sins is evident, but not spoken. So we read and we go forward to 7 verse 54, it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. So his accusations, they hit home and they experienced extreme emotion. You know, cut to the quick, sawn in two. Another way of saying that. They were sawn in two, they were cut in half. Gnashing of teeth, they were grinding their teeth, you know, argh, suppressed rage. Despite this, however, they don't make a move against him as he is still able to speak. So in verse 55, he says, but being full of, or rather Luke says, 
but being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now in his mercy and knowing what is to come, God gives Stephen a vision of the heaven that he is about to enter as his reward for being faithful unto death. Note that Luke mentions twice that Jesus is standing at the right hand of God, thus signifying His authority. Every time uh, you know, any writer in the Bible talks about the right hand of God, he's talking about authority and power. Some commentators and commenters suggest that Jesus is standing to welcome the first saint and martyr to reach heaven since the church was established on Pentecost Sunday. And remember, this is a deacon. I'm not you know, disparaging deacons here. I'm just saying the first martyr was a deacon. Any man selected to serve as a deacon has been selected to serve in an honorable ministry. Verse 57, but they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. You know, it's one thing to accuse them to their faces of rejecting the Messiah. After all, Peter had done the very same thing and every one of the 25,000 disciples in Jerusalem had basically done the same thing by accepting Christ. Now, however, this man was claiming to actually see both God and Jesus in heaven. This was now blasphemy in their eyes and it was to you know, raise himself up as one who could see God in the heavens. So they would hear no more and in a rage they moved to silence him. When they had driven him out of the city they began stoning him and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this, against, this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Note that the, quote, trial did not follow the normal procedure of a vote or a 24-hour cooling off period before pronouncing sentence, especially one that required execution. That was according to their own law. You know, if you pronounced a person guilty and worthy of death, you couldn't sentence him on the same day. You had to take a 24 hour period and then come back, you know, time to sober, you know, sober thinking, you know, think things over, and then you pronounce the sentence. Okay? Not to mention the fact that the Jews were not permitted to execute criminals. They had, they had to go through the Roman officials as they had done with Jesus. This was not a trial, this was an angry mob taking the law into their own hands and murdering someone in an act of rage. Now I believe that there were no repercussions. What they did was not only against Jewish law, it was against Roman law. But I think the reason there were no repercussions, one, Stephen was not a high profile person like Jesus, let's put it that way, or even the apostles. And he had not come to the attention of Herod or Pilate. Uh, and even if Christians complained and brought charges, they couldn't do so to the Jewish leaders for obvious reasons, and they dared not approach Pilate after what happened to Jesus. So Luke chooses to introduce Saul, whom we know becomes Paul, the apostle, at this point of his book, as one who minded the cloaks of those stoning season, uh, Stephen. Now, the witnesses were those who testified against Stephen. And according to Jewish law, these men were required to cast the first stones as the ones who had witnessed the crime for which the person was being stoned. So if you were a witness to this person, yeah, he did it, he's guilty, I saw him do it, uh, and then that person is convicted of death by stoning, then you, the witness, have to be the first one to throw a stone. It was a serious business if you were a witness against someone. Then you had to participate in that person's uh, execution. Deuteronomy, by the way, 17 verse 6. So in this case, these people were adding murder to the sin of perjury that they had already committed. Now Stephen is not afraid of dying because he is absolutely sure where he's going to the point where he calls on the Lord to receive his spirit. It says he fell asleep, signifying that he entered the period of waiting until Jesus 
returns. And what must have been hard for the Jews to bear, Stephen's final words are not a cry for help. They're not a curse on his attackers, but like Jesus, a plea to God to forgive those who are in the process of killing him. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I just, I just read a, a, a short article about a, an individual who was executed, I don't know where, in some state, but anyways. He was executed and, um, and they asked him, you know, they always asked the person, you know, do you have any final words? He was being executed by lethal injection and they, they asked him, do you, do you have any final words? And a lot of times at that moment they either say no or they say, well, I want to you know, ask forgiveness from those who I've, I've harmed and I apologize and you're uh, God, please, you know, last words. Well, this person, uh, they asked him if he had any last word and he started to curse. And he cursed the ones who were killing him. He cursed the ones that were putting him to death. He cursed the, the state, the net, you know, he had, you know. And the article said he kept going until he finally passed out and then he died. You know, an angry, evil man. And yet Stephen, it says, <laughs> it said, Lord, please forgive the ones who are throwing the rocks at me trying to kill me. In this way, you know, God provides us with a model for those who will suffer martyrdom. We often say the New Testament has patterns, you know, a pattern for how the church should be organized, a pattern for how we should take the communion, a pattern for how we should baptize. And, you know, and, and I agree, absolutely, there are patterns for how we do things. I believe the Bible also has a pattern for martyrdom, as we see here. First, don't act like your executioners. Don't act like your executioners. Secondly, keep your eyes of faith on Jesus because He's the one you're going to. Thirdly, don't exchange a few more years of life on this earth for an early departure for heaven. And finally, forgive those who are taking your life because in doing so they may have a chance to see you in heaven one day. Open the opportunity for them to be forgiven. When someone harms you or hurts you, why should you forgive them? Well, if you don't, the road to forgiveness is closed to them. You have to open the, 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 the doorway to forgiveness by forgiving them, so that at some point, if they cry out to God for forgiveness, He will forgive them. Important. All right, a couple of lessons just from the material that we've covered today. Satan always finds a way, doesn't he? Always finds a way. Notice that it doesn't take long before Satan begins his attacks on the young church in Jerusalem. You know, Peter's arrested to keep him quiet. Then all the apostles are arrested to remove the church's leadership. They're beaten. Then stirring up trouble in the benevolence ministry. Notice the trouble wasn't in the theology, it wasn't in the teaching, it was in the benevolence. Imagine, you're trying to do good. You're trying to do good. And that's the place where the trouble is going to start. And you know why? Because I'll tell you something, <laughs> nothing offends a person more than being accused of doing something bad when they're trying to do something good. That's the most hurtful type of accusation. When in Christian love and kindness you're making an effort to do something good or you know, in service to someone else and somehow somebody mistakes that information and turns it into something bad. That really hurts. And then attacks I'm saying the, the devil, attacks a dynamic servant of the church who is having an impact on the people in the name of Christ. And it began almost from the beginning and has continued throughout history to this very day. Those of you who've been members of this congregation, you know, you know what happens here sometime in every congregation. I've worked in many different congregations and you know, sooner or later there's always trouble of some kind. So Satan continually attacks the church, especially when it is growing and bearing fruit. 
So we need to be in our guard because we are growing and we are bearing fruit of good works, many good works. I always ask myself, you know, <laughs> when people come to see me and they say, well, I'm thinking this and oh my, I can't get this idea out of my mind and I'm discouraged and you know, and I always ask them, I say, okay, who is talking to you? If your heart is saying to you, you're no good. You're no good, you're not worthy, you're just not a good person. You, you may be able to fake it to the other people in the church, but I know, me, the guy inside of you, I know you're no good. And when they, people come to me and tell me something like that, I always ask the same question. Who's talking to you? Is that Jesus talking to you? Really? Is that, think now, is, have you ever heard Jesus say that? You're no good. You won't make it. You're not good enough. You haven't done enough. That, that's not Jesus talking to you. That's the devil talking to you. So Satan always finds a way to get to the church and get to individuals in the church. And maybe my exhortation here is try to decipher who it is who's attacking you. And number two, we will see what Stephen saw. Amen. We will see that. Stephen saw Jesus at the right hand of God just moments before he fell asleep. The kind of death that believers experience as they await Jesus' return and their awakening from sleep. We will both see and hear Jesus at the right hand of God saying, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what Jesus says. He's the one that says, keep going, don't quit. This is good. He's the one that says, that's a 30 fold increase. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, in the parable of the seed and the sowers, he says, you know, the, the one who sows the seed on good soil, he gets an increase 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. We kind of pass over that little passage there, 30, 60, 100. What's he telling us? You're not always going to hit a home run out of the park. It's not always going to be 100 fold, your effort to serve him, your ministry. It's not always going to be 100. Sometimes it'll be 30 or 60 or 100. That's what Jesus said. He says to you, good effort, keep trying. That was a 60 fold effort. Well, don't beat yourself up. <laughs> That's okay. This is what we'll experience a moment after we are awakened by an angel's trumpet in the call of the Lord when he returns. A word of encouragement, a word of welcome. Stephen was only a man, but as the first Christian to die, God had shown him, has shown all of us through him what to expect after death, no matter how we die. Peaceful sleep, a resurrection and the ability to see and hear Jesus himself and a welcome to heaven. A welcome to heaven. This is what I look forward to when I see the world and you know, the mess that it continually reports. You know, there's always been a mess. I just finished reading a book, a series of books that my daughter gave me on Winston Churchill, a very interesting character, a historical character, amazing human being. But the figure that kind of jumps out at me is the number of people who died in World War II. 40 million people. 40 million people died in World War II. You know, military people and civilians, 40 million. Every major city in Germany was reduced to ashes. London, the city of London and major cities in England, reduced to ashes. 40 million people dead. So let's try to get some perspective. The difference between then and now is that then you read about that in the paper that came out once a day or the radio that you know, had the six o'clock news. Today we have news and information bombarding us 
24 hours a day. I, you know, sometimes I wonder how would today's media, <laughs> how could they report 40 million deaths when it's front page news if Kim Kardashian buys a new sweater? <laughs> I mean, what would they do with 40 million people dying? So let, let's not let the exaggerations and the huffing and puffing of the media today discourage us. We live in a marvelous country. We are still free. Everybody, you know what? Everybody was free to come here today and hear a lesson from the Bible. And, and you know what? They were free to either come here and hear a lesson from the Bible or go across the street or go across to that one. You know? We might not agree with everything, but one thing I do agree with, isn't it wonderful that everybody has a choice? All right, so that's our lesson. We'll, we'll stop at Stephen because there's a whole other dynamic that begins after Stephen's uh, death and we'll continue that and there's the bell. Uh, our reading assignment for next week, Acts chapter eight, verse one to 943. Always appreciate you read ahead because as I say, don't always read all the material in class. Thank you. That is our class for this morning. Thank you very much for your attention.